it's written here, Jacob Glass has a large and varied following. <laughs> and they're here. <laughs> of his no holes barred style of spiritual boot camp. I know he practices and teaches Course in Miracles in various cities in Southern California. And I know Jacob to be a deeply spiritual, mystical man and a highly irreverent reverend <laughs> of this teaching. Please welcome Jacob Glass. Oh my goodness. Oh, it's so good to be here. How are you? We have to hurry up. <laughs> because we're in so much trouble. We're in so much trouble because I've never, I never speak for less than 90 minutes. <laughs> and we only have 30 minutes. So let me do this upright. You know, I won't do a travelogue, maybe a little. Because I've been speaking in San Diego now for probably around 15 years, I guess. And I started here, not at this location, but with this church. In fact, it was so long ago that I was a platinum blonde. <laughs> That's how long ago that was. And I was drunk the first talk, actually. <laughs> not even going to lie about that. I would like to say I was hungover, but I was still drunk. I actually, oh, I shouldn't be saying all this. Um, because I knew Kathy Hearn, who was the founding minister from Terry Cole Whitaker days, and that's where I started. I was living in Los Angeles when I came here to speak the first time, which would have been in like 1999 or something. Uh, but I had lived here during the Terry Cole Whitaker days and knew Kathy from Terry Cole Whitaker Ministries, and I had been lecturing in Santa Barbara for about a decade or so. And I sent out letters to all these religious science churches asking to guest speak. And Kathy Hearn was the only person who wrote me back. <laughs> she said, come on down. I'm going to be out of town. I don't care. <laughs> so <laughs> I did. <laughs> and I really came thinking, you know, I would just make a weekend of it. And so I stayed at the Park Manor Suites. And I stayed for two days. And I had a friend come down from Orange County, this crazy girl that I'd known for years, this ex-penthouse pet who hadn't been out of the house for a couple of years, married in Orange County, was so glad to get away from the family, and we just got ripped <laughs> in the bar downstairs at the Park Manor Suites. And I had to do two services, because they did two services then. So it was 9 and 11, and I just went in thinking, who cares, really? <laughs> they don't know me. Kathy's out of town. I'm just going to do this. They'll hate me. It doesn't matter. In fact, when I walked in, because I thought, nobody knows me in San Diego. And so my friend and I, we walked in with sunglasses on. <laughs> like, oh my god. And uh, as soon as we walked in the door and my friend opened her mouth, the, the staff person who'd come to greet us said, were you at the Park Manor Suites bar last <laughs> night? <laughs> OK, we're screwed. <laughs> Anyhow. And no one had told me that the first service was the quiet, meditative <laughs> service. And I was my normal, rowdy self. And they said, we've never seen them like that before. And now, here I am back many, many years later. And uh, even though it really is Christmas week, I want to talk about solstice. Because, of course, solstice was last night. And that really energetically is the new year. It's not the calendar new year, but energetically it is the new year. and so. That means that one cycle of energy is ending and one cycle is beginning. I've just started uh, in my classes. I now have a very tiny little space where I teach every week in Los Angeles in my home. So we have about 12 students, but I record them, and so those go out to all the people. But I don't speak in large groups that much anymore, but I'm sort of always doing these little series. So we're doing a 12-week series now that I want to talk about because it kind of kicks off the new year, and it's called You Were Born for Greatness. Did you know that you were born for greatness? I want to read specifically in A Course in Miracles where that comes from. It's in chapter 15. It says, 
Is it a sacrifice to leave littleness behind and wander not in vain? It is not sacrifice to wake in glory, but it is sacrifice to accept anything less than glory. Before the greatness that lives in you, your poor appreciation of yourself and all the little offerings you give slip into nothingness. So the Course in Miracles talks a lot about the difference between littleness and your bigness and grandeur and grandiosity. So when I say this morning that you were born for greatness and glory, keep in mind this has nothing to do with what you're going to do in the world. You already are that. If you never got up from your chair and did one more thing the rest of your life, it would not change the fact that the greatness and glory that you are is ever present. So the Course in Miracles says, you do not establish your worth by teaching or learning. Your worth is established by God. Nothing you think or wish or make is necessary to establish your worth. So we start from that place of it's already done. So what I'm teaching people to do during this series is you wake up, you look in the mirror in the morning, and you say, I was born for greatness and glory. You look yourself in the eyes and you say, I was born for greatness and glory. And you feel what that feels like. We live in a world where it's arrogant to think that about yourself. It's conceited. But keep in mind, we're not saying, I was born for greatness and glory, but these slobs were not. <laughs> it's seated in everyone. It's true about everybody. And really, that section of the course, along with the section of the course that talks about grandeur and grandiosity, is really the foundation. And if you've ever read A Return to Love, you, hear, you will read Marianne Williamson talking about that leading up into that very famous quote that was then erroneously <laughs> attributed to Nelson Mandela, nobody knows why, because he never said it. But it is that quote of, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate, it's that we are powerful beyond all measure. And she's, the first sentence of that is, the quote as I interpret it says, da 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 da. So it means that we start to think in those terms literally, personally. I was born for greatness and glory. See, the Course in Miracles says that our self-perception determines our behavior. That means you act like whoever you think you are at the moment. You will behave according to your own self-perception. I've been studying the Course in Miracles since I started studying religious science, which was with Terry Kowitter, because she was teaching both of those at the time. And The Course in Miracles is really, the workbook of the Course says it's a mind training. We've been trained to think one way, and the workbook teaches us to think another way, just like religious science teaches us to think a new way. And that's sort of the motto, right? It's change your thinking, change your life. Mary Madden Morrissey always used to say, we call this movement new thought, but when's the last time you had one? So it's about thinking and choosing new thoughts. And those new thoughts tend to run contrary to the way the world has taught us to think. So the Course in Miracles says it's not really a doing, it's an undoing. It's an undoing of the ways we've been trained to think less of ourselves and to think that our worth is established by what we accomplish in life, what we can do. And this, in Course in Miracles terms, is the difference between grandeur and grandiosity. That the grandiosity is, there's a line in the Course that says, grandiosity is always a cover for despair. <laughs> that's when you come from that place of, look what I've done, look what I've accomplished, look, that, look what I've achieved, that's what gives me value and worth in the world, is a way of covering up the fact that we feel worthless inside. That our real worth doesn't have anything to do with what we do in the world. But when you know who you are, everything you do is infused with that energy. When you don't know who you are, everything you do is infused with chaos and confusion and a false self. So to move into a state where you say, okay, in this new year, I'm gonna come from the foundation of, I was born for greatness and glory. 
That's literally who I actually am. So that means stepping into a bigger self. Stepping into a bigger life that has nothing to do with the externals. Sometimes the really expansive, miraculous idea is a downsizing. The ego always thinks of something big and grander as externally bigger and grander, right? The bigger house, the nicer car, the whatever. But to the spirit within us, the really large and grand idea is anything that allows you to be more of who you actually are. And that really is about <sighs> relax. Stop all auditioning. <laughs> you already got the part. <laughs> you get to be you. Now play it all the way. That's the deal, is you already have the part. There's nothing to prove to anybody. You might as well just enjoy the ride. Enjoy yourself. Have a good time. Knock yourself out. I used to tell people, call off the search. <laughs> the search for the person, the thing, the place out there that's going to be it. When you move into the place of, I was born for greatness and glory, and I'm going to leave my littleness behind, then the things of the world just become things of the world. That's all they are. They're not good. They're not bad. They're just the things of the world. You have them if they're fun. If they're not fun, you turn away from them. But it's a decision that we make. And one of the things that I've been talking to in my groups is saying, what is it that you believe? What is it that you really, truly believe? You know, um, The Course in Miracles, for those of you who don't know, is a book. And it's about that big. The Science of Mind text is about that big. And you stop every now and then. I'll say to my groups every now and then, I apologize for the word I'm about to say. I'll say to my groups every now and then, you have to stop when you're doing all this work every now and then and say, I either believe this shit or I don't. Because this is a lot of reading to do for something I'm ambivalent about. <laughs> I mean, we, this is a certain point where you just go, do I believe this stuff or not? What do I really, truly believe? Because what happens is when stuff goes wrong, that's when you find out what you really believe. Not the book you're carrying around and the bumper sticker. <laughs> but you find out where does your mind turn when you get laid off, when they tell you you have this disease, when so-and-so leaves you. That's when you start to find out what you really believe, what you really turn to. So that's why I've encouraged people to start to say, to like write down what I believe and then to really start to formulate what you want to think and what you want to believe and type it out, print it out, and put it somewhere where you see it all the time, where every day you have your statement of belief. Right? I believe that thoughts are things. I believe that there is a dynamic something in the universe which responds to our thoughts, our words, and attitudes. If you are, this is how we talk to ourselves, right? The ways that we talk to ourselves. If maybe somebody just said it here. I've heard it a lot lately. I never remember where I hear stuff. Could have been five seconds ago. The guy who introduced me, I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> or at the beginning. But they tell us that like 80 to 90% of our thoughts are negative and repetitive. 80 to 90% of our thoughts, that means that your ego hasn't even had any new information for you in a long, long time. <laughs> like the crap you've been worried about now, you were worried about 30 years ago in a slightly different form. There's no new horrifying information from your ego. So the idea that I'm going to start feeding my mind with what I want to believe with what I choose to believe about myself, about life, about what's real to me. I was telling people this in class. I said, you know, just write out, as I was getting ready, I was saying, 
I'll just have like a little sheet and then have people like write out their beliefs every day. Well, <laughs> I started to write my own and it turned into three typewritten pages. I was like, we can't do this every day. <laughs> write out this many. But you start to get on a roll. It's a good thing to start to get on a roll of what is it that you really believe about life. And, you know, Louise Hay lives here in San Diego, and she's sort of the queen of this kind of thing, which is fabulous. Her whole thing is, is it's only a thought, and a thought can be changed. And I've heard her say, gosh, I don't know how, she's in her 80s, I know, but I know that when she turned 80, I remember seeing her on video coming out on stage at one of those Hay House conferences and saying, this is going to be the best decade of my life. How many people here saw the PBS special, Age of Champions? See, I watch TV so you don't have to. <laughs> Nobody saw it but you, Jacob. And they wonder why PBS is going downhill. Nobody's <laughs> watching any TV but you. The Age of Champions was a special about the Senior Olympics. So it was all of these people who were in the Senior Olympics. And there was one guy in particular who I think was 100 years old, tennis player. The guys who were filming this documentary were probably in their late 20s or early 30s, I think. And he beat them at tennis. <laughs> like 100 years old. His daughter was on with him, and she was saying, uh, you know, that all of her life he had always said, I'm going to live to be 100. I'm going to live to be 100. I'm going to live to be 100. That was his affirmation. He didn't know it was an affirmation. That was just his statement of truth. I'm going to live to be 100. And there he was on screen saying, at 100, saying, I'm just beginning the whole next part of my life. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. <laughs> I mean, when you just think about the things you don't do, because it's going to be hard to park. <laughs> and here are all these people that were like in their 80s and 90s and 100, there were two guys, two African-American brothers who were swimmers. And they had been swimming so long that when they started swimming, they lived in Washington, D.C., and they were not allowed, the African-Americans were not allowed in the public pools. And so they would sneak into the Washington Monument and swim in that big, <laughs> can you believe that? Because they loved swimming so much and they were, and so they were like, I think, one was like 88 and the other one was like 91 or something. And one of them had cancer. And he had like, I think a Hickman where they were doing like the chemotherapy and stuff. And he was in the middle of chemotherapy. So he would do like chemotherapy on Monday but be swimming on Wednesday. And you think about the times you don't go to the gym. <laughs> right? And what was he talking about? Not his chemotherapy, he was talking about swimming and trying to beat his brother. <laughs> right? So. When I was watching this, I started saying in our groups, you have to come from the place where no matter how old you are, you can say, my best years are still ahead of me. Because a lot of us start thinking at a certain point, well, the best is behind me, and I'm going to start winding down into decrepitude now. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Cole Whitaker is sort of famous for saying, when people, she will say, someone will say, I'm on a fixed income, and she always says, well, who fixed it? You did, right? That's you, that's your limitation, is you believe you're on a fixed income. When you say that, that's your affirmation. That's what you're saying is true from you. That is you embracing your littleness. Not moving into your greatness and your glory, but really settling into your littleness and your smallness. Instead of moving into that place of, what do I believe is possible for me? Not just what do I believe is possible, what do I believe is possible for me? Because a lot of people in New Thought will say, well, all things are possible, but they don't mean for them. <laughs> they mean for you. Right? A lot of times, you know, you just have a limiting thought. I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fact, right? It's real. You just aren't thinking right. So we start to realize this changing your thinking never ends. It never ends. That's what I love about Louise Hay is she's still discovering, just as we all are, these places where she's going, I had a limiting thought. I realized I had a limiting thought. She didn't start 
dancing until she was in her 70s because she had a school teacher who told her that her feet were too big and she was clumsy. So she never danced. So she realized in her 70s, 20 years after writing You Can Heal Your Life, <gasps> I was believing that I couldn't dance because of something that was told to me. So we're always, it's always that undoing. You find, you get excited about it then. You get excited about finding limiting thoughts. <laughs> you go, <gasps> I found a limiting thought. That means I can undo it and I'll be freer. But it's great. It's not like, oh no, there's another limiting thought. <laughs> You go, oh my gosh, that's great, because you just turn on the light then. I'm going to read this little. You know what I love about, I love so much about Ernest Holmes, but he makes it so simple because it is simple. He will say, well, oh, yeah, we'll just reverse the thought pattern. <laughs> that's it. We'll just reverse the thought pattern. Not, well, maybe I'll have some therapy, and I'll take another class, and I'll be rebirthed, and I'll do that. Says, no, it's just a thought. We'll just reverse the thought pattern. You've been thinking this way. We'll just turn around. We'll go that way. And when I started to get that in this last year, <laughs> what? It really is that simple? That you just turn on the light and the light is there? That's it? Do you know that light moves at the speed of light? <laughs> that was my big realization this year, <laughs> is that light moves at the speed of light. Uh, let me read this from... The Art of Life by Ernest Holmes. About light. You are using the law of life every time you think. No matter how long you may have been using it wrongly in your ignorance, the very day, that hour, yes, the very moment you begin to use this power rightly, the effects of having used it wrongly will pass from your experience. Does it make any difference how long a room has been dark when you introduce light? How long the earth has been parched when refreshing rains come to bring new life, a new seed time, and a new harvest to the fields? It's like that. It's like that. When you turn on the light, bam, it's light, just like that. You had an old thought. doesn't matter if you had it your whole life. The second you think it's possible for me, boom, you're on a new path. Just like that. We have this illusion that it takes time. It doesn't take time. It's okay if it does. I want you to hear that. It's okay if it does, but it doesn't have to. It's not necessary at all. We believe a lot of things because some expert, and I put that in quotes, <coughs> tells us, oh, it takes this long to get over divorce. Oh, it takes this long to recover from this. Oh, it takes this long. That's just somebody's stupid guess. Studies have shown that most studies are eventually proven wrong. <laughs> Just do it now. Right? So it's okay if it takes us time. It's not about, you know, you have to get over something right away. But we have to have the freedom in our mind to say it doesn't have to be that way. There is really no such thing as time in that sense. I can recover as quickly as I recover from whatever it is, right? That light moves that quickly. The miracle happens that fast. I mean, we're used to the idea of things just went to hell on a minute. <laughs> like we were all going along, it was fine, then it just all fell apart like that. <laughs> but we don't really think in terms of it can go good that quickly too. But it can. It can be hell on earth and then just boom, Turn to heaven like that. I've been talking about that movie, uh, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? You know that movie? And uh, Isabel Sanford, who played the maid in that, when she's all upset about, you know, uh, this interracial romance that's starting, she's running around saying, All hell done broke loose. <laughs> all hell done broke loose. And then Catherine Hepburn later quotes her and says, Oh, I don't know, but she said, All hell done broke loose. And I started thinking, What's the opposite of that? All heaven done broke loose. But that's what it really means to change your thought. That's what Ernest Holmes means when he says reverse your thought pattern. Think of yourself differently. Think of the year ahead and think, what would it mean for me to just embody my greatness and glory? To let go of my littleness. All the little ways that I say, I can't, it's too late, I shouldn't, what will people think, how will I do it? All of that to just 
as each thought comes up, you just notice it and you turn it around. Maybe I can, maybe I will. And you start moving in that direction. One of the, um, I, I live in Los Angeles now and so I get, uh, every now and then, especially during the summer, I will fill in for Marianne Williamson when she's out of town. So that kind of gets me out of my apartment. Uh, <laughs> forced out of my apartment again to see people. And so, you know, sometimes uh, people will start getting my tapes and things like that. And so there's a, a girl who is in one of my classes now, and she's an actress, and she was saying recently when we did that whole thing about looking at your beliefs, she said uh, it was fascinating to me how quickly it happened because she said, I don't know anybody who works harder at this than I do. I'm auditioning all the time, I'm taking classes all the time, I, I keep everything current, I'm constantly really hustling and working and going for it. But until we started this thing about looking at our beliefs, I didn't realize that underneath all of that, I had the belief that it wasn't gonna happen for me. So I want you to look at your life and think about all the things you're doing in order to have the life you say you want, but you don't really believe you will. Because as soon as she realized that, just like that, in her, she went, oh, I don't actually think it's gonna happen for me. She just reversed the thought. And within a week or so, she got a gig on a show for a week, like NCIS or something like that. Because she changed her belief. The ego is obsessed with, what am I gonna do? 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 What will we do? What do we do? So when we start to think about the new year, then we start to think about what we're gonna do. We're gonna go to the gym. We're gonna clean up our eating. We're gonna do this or that. But none of that will have any long-term lasting effect if we haven't had a change in consciousness. Because it's our consciousness that creates lasting change. So we can do these things, and so that's why I always say, you know, Oprah, lose the weight, gain the weight, lose the weight, gain the weight, lose the weight, gain the weight. Why? Because every time she loses the weight, all she ever says when you see her anywhere is, I still hate to exercise. <laughs> that is a terrible affirmation. <laughs> right? You haven't changed your consciousness. You've done the external, so you have this growth and you have this expansion, but if you don't have the consciousness to go with it, then we just slide back down the mountain again. We climb our way up with struggle and work and effort and get in there, and then as soon as we just take a breather, we roll back down. Because <laughs> that we don't have what, you know, what Ernest Holmes calls the mental equivalent of the experience. One of the consciousness to hold this space, this is something I read to people ad nauseum all the time, probably read it a million times here in San Diego. Let's make it a million and one. <laughs> this is from an old, this is out of print. I, I, they used to go crazy at the bookstores all the time because I would always recommend out of print books. <laughs> I really only like to read dead people's books, <laughs> mostly. But this is uh, called Ernest Holmes Seminar Lectures, and it actually is from the first Asilomar. So it's like transcripts from the talks that he gave there. And he's talking about um, a practitioner that he was working, or about when he first started out practicing. About that time, I experienced another difficulty which I had to work out. I had a large practice, but I found that almost no one paid me. Now let all practitioners and leaders, that's too many people groaned with that, okay. <laughs> right? You work really hard and people are not paying you. He's gonna give us the secret to it right here. <laughs> We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> Now let all practitioners and leaders listen. I had very little income. I could pay my rent and I was still eating, but I was no longer receiving a paycheck every two weeks from the city for I had quit that job. So I treated everyone I could think of and everything I saw, the woods, the flowers, and so on. And then one day in my office, okay, let me just stop there. 
So he was treating everything outside himself. We get that right away. When you start praying for more customers, you're praying for conditions to be different. So one day I sat down in my office and I said, I will never get up from this chair until I know why people do not pay me. <laughs> because I had made a definite assertion, I had no sooner said it than I stood right up and explain, exclaimed why I don't expect them to. I had wanted them to pay me, but I hadn't expected them to do so. Troward said that a neurotic thought pattern, which is morbid, repeats itself with monotonous regularity throughout life until it is changed. And that was a kind of morbid thought pattern. Then I realized that I had to treat myself because the thought pattern had nothing to do with my clients. It couldn't, for I wasn't letting them pay me. They did want to pay me, because after I had gotten my thinking straight about it, within 30 days, many people I had worked for came in and paid me, saying that they had just forgotten to do so. There is nothing to treat but your own thought. I had another experience which taught me a great deal about the consciousness of supply. In the earlier days of our work, one of the loveliest practitioners we have ever had on our staff took an office next to mine. This was before we had our own building. About a year later, she told me that she would have to give up her office, and when I asked her why, she said she was not making enough to pay the rent and could not keep it. I said to her, why well, I thought you had a large practice. She replied, oh, I'm busy every minute. Oh, I said, that's ridiculous. You should be making very good money. You know there's nothing wrong in being paid for your work. Although I know there are people who think that you shouldn't be paid for spiritual mind treatment, I do not believe that there's anything wrong in being paid for the work that we do. I would suggest that these people examine their thinking, examine the underlying motive of this belief. They might be surprised as to what they will find. The practitioner was a very sweet and sincere person. She was what I call the religious type, much more religious than I am. I questioned her about her background, and it developed that all her life she had worked for social welfare, or welfare organizations, either for the county or state, the city or church. Immediately, I saw the cause of her problem. She had always expected to give, but had never expected to be given to. When she asked me what she could do about it, I said, that's easy. We'll just reverse the thought pattern. <laughs> Within a few months, she became one of the most successful practitioners we have ever had. So I'm asking you today to think about what do you really believe? And what you believe, start to expect. Prepare for it. Prepare for it. Start to move into the space of, I expect things to go well. I expect things to work out. I expect to be prospered. I expect to feel good. I expect to be welcomed. I expect to have a good time. What is your intention for the new year? If you go to my website, jacobglass.com, jacobglass.com, <laughs> you'll see up at the top a resources link. If you go to the resources page and scroll down, you'll see there's a PDF for a New Year's booklet that you can download. And you can just print it out. What it is is it tells you how to print it out, and then you put it together, and you fold it in half, and the Left-hand side is all about reflecting on 2013. What you learned, what you release, what you're grateful for, all that stuff. Then the right-hand side is the new year. What are your intentions? What are your goals? This is something we learned from Edwin Gaines years ago. Your goals should sound fun to you. If your goals don't sound fun to you, they're not your goals. They're somebody else's that you have taken on. Because you should. So if there's a goal that you want, but it doesn't sound fun to you, then your job is, how can I make it fun for me? That's how I paid off my debt years ago, was I had to let go of my resistance and resentment about the debt and make it a fun goal of how I was going to make paying it off a gain, right? So that's what you do. So you start to set your intention. You start to look at, if I'm setting my intentions, then it's not a wish list. Wishing will get you nowhere. There's no wishing or hope in new thought. 
There's no power in hope at all. Hope is the ego's way of keeping you like this. <laughs> we have belief. We understand law. We have knowledge of law. We don't need hope. Hope is when you don't understand the law. Then you hope, hope it works out. I'm wishing for you and hoping it'll work out. Well, good for you. <laughs> That's not directing your thought. That's not taking control of your mind. The Course in Miracles, one of the lessons is, I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. I rule my mind, which I alone must rule. What else did I want to tell you? So many things. One of the things, that, uh, a couple years ago we read a book, I think by Gail Hendricks, that was called Your Upper Limits. That's where you want to start thinking in terms of that we all have an invisible glass ceiling that is our consciousness. And it's the place beyond which we don't allow ourselves to go. It's the place where that's the most I can really get to. And oftentimes, in, the, in a ministry I was in many, many years ago, they called it your turnaround point. You get to that place, and it's the place you always get to, and then it seems like you can't go any further, so you stop and turn around and go all the way back somewhere else. So you get to a certain place in a business, and then you go, well, they're not promoting me here. It's because these people are assholes. <laughs> they don't see who I am. There's no room for advancement here. My boss is a jerk. This one. And so you leave there, and you go somewhere else. But all that's happened is you've hit your upper limit. And you think it's the situation that you're in. But every situation is just a demonstration of our own consciousness. So the Course in Miracles says it's not up to you what you learn. It's only up to you what you learn at a given time. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. So it means we all have lessons to learn that have to do with what we see as our upper limit, what's possible for us. So we'll sign up for the class, we'll get to the place we always get to, and then once it gets to that place where it's uncomfortable and we would actually have to really change, <laughs> then we look around and go, I don't like the teacher. <laughs> this school sucks. <laughs> I'm going to another school. And then you go back and you just do the same thing over and over. That's what it means when it says everywhere you go, there you are. And because our subconscious and our consciousness is really in cahoots with the universe for us to learn and grow, then what happens is, is that you're just, you know, you're in the same situation, but it's more externally attractive to you so that you won't notice, right? You'll, you'll get, you'll think, oh no, this is totally different now this time. I am not making the same mistake I did last time. This is totally different. So it takes you like a whole year to realize you've married your father again. <laughs> you look and go, oh God, you look good taller. It fooled me. <laughs> Just totally didn't realize it. So instead, you just decide, no, <laughs> I am going to change my consciousness and then be lifted. Be lifted. So that if this is not the right job or this is not the right town or this is not the right whatever, then it won't be about me struggling to get out of it and starting all over again. It will be an unfolding. It will just be like, okay, this is what's next. This is me moving into that place of boldness and courage. And that's what it takes. It takes a boldness and a courage to live from the place of your greatness and your glory. I remember hearing, and I've talked about this a lot lately, Oprah Winfrey saying in her first interview with uh, Barbara Walters, which was back in the late 80s, pr probably the first year or so after the Oprah Winfrey show started. And in that interview, and there's the clips of this, you can see this on YouTube and everywhere, and it was shown everywhere because it was kind of an outrageous thing to say is that Barbara Walters said, I know enough of your story to know that you didn't have an easy childhood and it's been very hard for you. And what is it that has given you this confidence, you, that you have this real sense of self? And Oprah said, I've always known that I was born for greatness. And that was horrifying to people to say that because people don't say shit like that. <laughs> You're not supposed to say stuff like that in public. 
Like that was like, who? What? Because I mean, when you think about it, seriously, at the time, she was just a talk show host. Like she was not, oh, brah, you got a car, you got a car. You'll... Like that was 20 years down the road from there. Right? And she's like, I am know that I was born for greatness was kind of an arrogant thing to say in terms of the ego. Right? But what the Course is saying is that until you can say that, you can't fulfill your destiny. Because your greatness doesn't have anything to do with necessarily that you're going to achieve something great in the world. It just means that you're going to be purely you. Just the way you are and just the way you are not. And that the process of becoming more and more you is not about a gathering up, but a letting go. So in A Course in Miracles, Jesus basically says, the difference between me and you is that I have everything the Father gave me and nothing else. You have everything the Father gave you plus a whole lot of other crap. <laughs> what they taught you in school and what they said on television and what your family believes, all that extra stuff. So in order for you to manifest really at the level of your greatness, you have to let go of that. All of that other stuff that you've been taught has to go. And the Course in Miracles basically says there are people who would literally rather die than change. Rather die than change. And the Course in Miracles in fact says the, the changes that the ego wants to make are not really changes. They're not really changes. The motto of New Thought or Religious Science is change your thinking, change your life. But a lot of us are like, change your hairstyle, change your life. <laughs> right? Just it's always sort of like an external, like what Marianne Williamson used to call rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, a different town, a different boyfriend, a different car, it'll all be great. Right? But because I don't want to really face like that place. That's why, you know, it was so wonderful seeing this woman who just in a, just in a moment of, oh, I've been working really hard at something that I don't believe is really going to happen for me. And I just change my thought, and immediately it starts working. That's how fast it can be if you're really willing to face, oh, this is where I've been thinking a limiting thought. This is where I've been thinking something that's holding me back, and I want to think something else. This is what I'm going for this year. Right? I was looking as I was doing, I did a little ceremony last night for the solstice, and I was going over the book, my book that I've filled in, and as I look back, I was like, this has been the best year of my life so far. More ease, more joy, more abundance, more health, more love, more of everything good, more peace, more effortlessness, all of that. But I didn't really recognize, you don't recognize it so much when you're living it. I was grateful all the time, but until I sat back and really reflected on it, I was like, this was awesome. Well, we have to do that. We have to be reflecting on these things all the time to notice it and talk about it. The same girl who was saying to me about another friend of hers who's an actress, and she said, you know, uh, a year ago we were in the same classes and doing the same thing, and now my friend is on a, a major TV show, and she's a regular, and she's doing all this stuff. And she said, when I get together with her, most of the time, she's kind of complaining. <laughs> she's sort of complaining about, you know, like, oh, this and that and the other thing. And she said, I'm looking at her thinking, what are you saying? <laughs> right? But that's how the ego gets us, do isn't it? Haven't you noticed? Like, sometimes you don't even know your dream has come true because you're too busy bitching. <laughs> right? Why? Because it's never perfect. And so the ego mind will always just look at the one thing that's not good enough. Yes, it's a mansion, but not enough storage. <laughs> right, the one thing that's just going to ruin this moment. Because that's all the ego mind wants to do is steal your joy in this moment. All the e that's all the ego wants to do is steal your joy in this moment. I've, it made me think of uh, the Dolly Parton and Julia Roberts on Steel Magnolias, 
They went on, uh, the whole cast, everybody, was on Oprah when that film first came out. And Julia Roberts, this was the only the second movie she'd ever done, and so she was telling this anecdote about Dolly Parton. She said, you know, I don't know where it was filmed, in Georgia or somewhere like that, and it was hot, and it was the summer, and it was sticky and sweaty, and there were bugs everywhere and all this stuff, and she said, we were all just complaining and having a horrible time except for Dolly. Dolly's just happy all the time. Just you look over, Dolly's smiling, and she's singing a song, and of course, Dolly's in an enormous wig. So she's hotter than anybody. But no complaining, nothing at all. And she said, one day I finally said to her, you know what, we're all hot. You're as hot as the rest of us. Why is it that you're always in a good mood and you're never complaining? And she said, I dreamed my whole life of being a movie star, and I'm not going to complain now that I'm here. <laughs> and how many times have we gotten somewhere and forgotten that? I dreamed my way here. I visioned my way here. This was where I wanted to be, and now that I'm here, I'm not fully enjoying it because it's not perfect. Doesn't fit my ego's pictures of exactly the way it's supposed to be. In fact, there's a really, one of those hit you over the head parts of the Course of Miracles that talks about, you know, because it calls everybody your brother. So it says, when you're thinking about your brother, think about all of his kindnesses instead of that one way in which he is not perfect. <laughs> right? Well, yes, but he always brings home the wrong milk. He knows better, right? <laughs> that whatever it is that our mind just focuses, so you cannot really truly be joyous in this moment. And that's really what the Course in Miracles is talking about when it's talking about your littleness. Our littleness, our pettiness, our smallness, our resistances, the constriction of our mind and of our heart, the, all of those things have to go in order for us to step into this idea of, I was born for greatness and glory. That's what I was born for. That's what every single being was born for, is greatness and glory. And I have to just step into that to allow that to be. So if you think about the year ahead, and you think about this idea of this is my year of stepping into greatness and glory, resist the temptation at first to think that it means you're going to do something. And think in terms instead of how you're going to see yourself. How, who am I going to be? One of the things that I've started doing uh, with the groups is really focusing on how you want to feel more than anything else. If you think about 2014, how do you want to feel no matter what happens? What are the dominant feelings you want to have? And What's the energy you want to bring to that year? What is the energy that you want to bring to 2014? Because that's what it'll be. It'll be whatever you say it is. Because mind always proves us right. It just gathers up the evidence. For, so I can sit here and say, listen, I, I know I need to wind up. So <laughs> I will sometimes sit out on my patio and say, I can just look over this way and think about how it's the worst it's ever been. I can tell the story of my past and my family and my potential and what I've done and what I haven't done and how it's the worst it's ever been. And then without anything changing at all, I can look over here and tell the story about how it's the best it's ever been. And I can tell the story of my family and my potential and my work and use the exact same past to validate that it's the best it's ever been. So since we're making it all up, I would suggest you make it up good. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you.